Hi there. I'm going to now take you through my PowerPoint on AC 2.1 of Unit 4, which is entitled Forms of Social Control. Now, when it comes to the examination in Unit 4, virtually every single question in the exam will have the phrase social control in it. So I make no bones about this. This is a long PowerPoint. I'm going to go into quite a lot of detail, but you really need to understand exactly what we mean by social control. You need to have an understanding of social control theories and you need to understand how society exercises social control. It's key to this part of the course. So without further ado, let's progress. So social control in a nutshell is the way that society ensures that we as members of society conform to its laws, conform to its rules, conform to its norms. And so basically we don't commit crime and we avoid deviant acts. That is what we mean by social control, ensuring that people behave basically. Now, there are many ways this can be achieved, but basically you can have informal social control and informal is based on unwritten laws and processes. So it could be something like the, the disapproval of others, but it's, it's people and things that influence us in an informal way. So that could be family, friends, colleagues, education system, religion, the media, okay? At the same time, we have formal social control, and that is based on written rules and laws. So that's fairly straightforward. That's the way the state regulates and controls our actions and behaviours through the legislative process. So that's the police, the courts, the prison service and the government. So here you see a little chart that basically sums up the difference between formal and informal social control. So formal social control, as I've said, based on rules and laws, whereas informal based on unwritten laws and there we go. You can look at that at your leisure. I'm going to move on. Social control theory is very different from everything we've done before. Most of the theories in criminology that we've dealt with, particularly the ones you would have looked at in Unit 2, are asking the question, why do people commit crimes? Notice the question, I've missed, I've missed the question mark off there, but so what? We'll live with that. So if you think of the theories that you looked at in Unit 2, which are basically your biological theories, such as your genetic theories, Jacobs XYY, twin adoption studies, your physiological theories, Lombroso, Sheldon, etc., your individualist, th individualist theories, such as Bandura, Freud, Bowlby, etc., Kohlberg, Isenck, and your sociological theories, so functionalism, Durkheim, Merton, labeling theory, Marxism, realism left and right etc all of these theories are saying well you know what makes someone commit crime the social control theory is different everything's flipped on its head so instead of asking why criminals break the law it asks why do people obey the law which is the total opposite of everything we've done in unit two why do people choose to obey the law and not break it and it's looking for social factors that make us obey the law. What is it in society that makes someone law abiding? So what is it that makes these people behave in this way? So these are some fo England football hooligans and these people behave in this way. So that is um, the Exeter Chiefs rugby crowd. Okay, why are those fans so well behaved? Particularly good looking person there in the middle. So the fact that you have a football match in our society where fans have to be segregated, they can't be together. That is the way football is. And yet in rugby, all the fans are together. They've all been drinking and yet, and there's never police in the ground and there's never violence in what is ostensibly quite a violent sport. And I use this to illustrate how social control theory is working, because what it's saying is, well, what makes those people there on the right behave? What is it 
what social factors means that you don't need to have a huge police presence at a premiership rugby game? What is it that means you don't have to segregate crowds in a premiership rugby game? What is it that means you can sell as much drink as you want to people in a premiership rugby game and yet there still isn't this violence? What is it? And that's what we're going to explore now. So there are lots of different social control theories because <laughs> different criminologists believe that different things help people keep people be law abiding and I'm going to deal with those individual theories towards the end of this PowerPoint but I want to get some um, key concepts across to you first. So all these theories are going to focus on as I said before on the reasons why people obey the law not the reasons why they break it. Okay. So social control theory is basically proposing that if you use the process of social socialization or society uses the process of socialization and social learning to build self-control within its within its people and this social control reduces that urge that inclination to indulge in antisocial behavior so it says that our relationships our commitments our values our norms, our mores, our beliefs, all work together to encourage people not to break the law. Now, I've used some new terms in there, and I'm just going to make sure you understand these because I've used the word mores, and I'm not sure that everyone will know what that means. And uh, a year ago, the word was used in an exam question, and it uh, flunked a few people out, even though it is on, on all my sheets that you have to know the phrase. And I definitely cover it in this PowerPoint, but people seem to forget. So let's look at this again. So norms, basically that's acceptable behavior within society or culture. You know, it, it's what's considered plight or rude. And of course that can differ from culture to culture. So, um, in, in, so it, would, it would be considered in our culture extremely rude to burp, to belch during a meal, whereas in other cultures it's actually considered to be quite polite to do that. Um, making eye contact when you shake someone's hand in some cultures is seen to be the right thing to do and in others not. So I've given some examples here of some norms. So in our society, queuing. Um, wearing a black tie to a funeral, giving up a seat on a bus for an OAP, saying please and thank you, are all examples of societal norms within the UK. Now, a more is something that's slightly different. It, it's a bit more than a norm. It's a moral belief. It's the good or bad ways of behaving. So it's, it's much more deeply ingrained within society and culture. If you turned up to a funeral not wearing a black tie, uh, you know, the, the most you get is you might get the odd look, but it's it's not it wouldn't be seen as a serious infringement of of uh, the way society right um, runs. Whereas mores are more to do with that. So, for instance, in some science societies, not ours, the subservient role of women in some cultures, respect for the elderly and others, the idea that in the USA that you must respect the flag, or the uh, you know when someone's provided you with good service that you tip is, and if you don't tip. That would be the absolutely appalling way of behaving in the, uh, behaving in the USA, whereas in Britain, not everyone tips after a meal, but it's the absolute expectation in the USA. So that's more and more a something that is if you don't do or you do do, it's either really good or really bad, but not necessarily illegal. OK. So. Let's move on. OK, if moral co codes are internalized, and individuals are tied into and have a stake in their wider community, they'll voluntarily limit their desire to commit deviant acts. That's what we mean by social control theory. We need to impose these moral codes on people. We need to make them so they're ingrained, they're internalized, and they feel part of our community, and so they won't do things that go against our community. So social control theory is seeking to understand the ways in which it's possible to reduce the likelihood of criminality developing in individuals. 
So it's not considering the motives behind issues. It's simply saying that human beings may choose to engage in a wide variety of activities unless the range is limited by the processes of socialization and social learning. So it's saying that we as human beings all have the propensity, the urge to do bad things, but we don't. And why is it that we don't? I'm sure that if I sat in a class and said, listen guys, um, I, could, I could guarantee that we could go down into Plymouth and rob every single bank, and I guarantee you wouldn't be caught, who's up for it? I suspect the vast majority of the, of the class would be up for it. So what is it? We've now established the vast majority of the class are inherently dishonest. So what is it that's stopping them doing what is an illegal act? So social control can be, I think, achieved in two distinct ways. Um, broadly speaking, you've got two different theories and ideas, but they fall into two categories. And these are the idea of internal social control. So and that's the idea that rules and morality are internalized by members of society. And therefore, because they've been internalized, they don't commit crime. So I put it in bold. So it's the idea that the control, the, st the idea that we don't go down and rob a bank comes from within us. Alternatively, you go down the rule that you've got external forms of social control and these stop people from committing crime in the first place. And that's the control that comes from outside ourselves. That's Big Brother watching you, that sort of thing. So let's look at internal forms of social control. And actually, this should be old hat for you because you have touched on this in unit two. So if I use the phrase conscience, you should straight away be thinking Freud and superego. The idea, you know, as Freud said this, you've got this superego that tells us what's right and wrong and inflicts guilt feelings on us when we don't follow it. It develops in our early years as we grow up, as, as we become socialised. And the superego is there to restrain that antisocial id, that really unpleasant part within us that we don't want everyone to know about. And because that superego works against the id, it gives us that social control as we grow, when we become socialised. And because we're socialised, that makes us behave in a socially acceptable way. It's that idea with Homer of the angel and the devil on your shoulder and the superego there, there's your angel and the id is your devil. The superego, as you grow, becomes more powerful if you have been socialised correctly. Other forms of internal social control. Well, tradition and culture is an absolute key one. So the culture and tradition to which we belong becomes part of us through socialisation. And that would mean that we would accept its values, its norms and traditions, you know, whatever culture, religion, tradition we've grown up in, we've become part of that. Religious traditions, as I put, are a really good example of us because what they do is they affirm one's identity. They affirm as being accepted in a particular community. And I make no bones for using these pictures here. So tradition and culture. Um, if we take Friday Night Dinner, the uh, comedy programme, which I particularly enjoy, Friday Night Dinner is actually looking at the cultural tradition within Judaism that at the start of the Sabbath, the holy day, you all as a family share a meal together on the Friday night because that is when Sabbath starts. So even though the family are not, I would argue, are not particularly God, um, strong practicing Jews, because it's part of their tradition, because it's part of that culture, they meet on a Friday always to have dinner as a family because it's become ingrained within them. They've become socialized. Likewise, the idea that you have um, Muslims praying five times a day at the same time, all facing in the same direction, the Kaaba in Mecca. And there you've got hundreds of thousands of Muslims praying together all doing the same actions, 
all facing the same direction. It's that idea of being uh, a part of a group, being socialised, part of that tradition, and you become that. Just as in America, in schools, people every morning in school will pledge allegiance to the flag of America with your hand on your heart, and you're part, you're in it together, you're part of the same country. And gradually, as that grows through childhood, it becomes part of you. So our conscience, our superego, our tradition, our culture become part of us, as I've just said. It starts from the outside, but it becomes internalised. It becomes part of us. It becomes part of what it makes us who we are. And that is through socialisation. I've been using the word all the way through this PowerPoint. Hopefully you now understand what it means. So what happens is society's rules actually through socialization become our own personal rules and moral code and because they become ours that means we are conforming to the norms of the society in which we are raised and the other key term you need to be aware of is is rational ideology and that's the phrase that's used to explain how we start to internalize the rules of society and use them to then to define what is right and wrong and therefore that makes us obey the law keep within the law of the society in which we are living because we've internalized those rules we know what's right and wrong forgive the extra s on the end there outside of that we have the opposite which is external forms of social control now these are things that are outside of us that society uses to ensure that we conform to its expectations and that we obey its rules. And these basically are known as the agencies of social control. And actually, all my previous PowerPoints from 1.2 onwards have been talking about some of these agencies of social control. Not all of them, but some of them. So any organisation or institution that imposes rules on us in order to make us behave in certain ways is an agency of social control. Your family is an agency of social control. When your parents enforce rules and tell you how to behave, that is an agency of social control. Your peer group are an agency of social control. You know, when if you're in a certain group, what you can and can't do, what is the right thing to do, what's the wrong thing to do. The education system is an agency of social control. You know, there's the teacher telling someone off on the left. There's the you know, uh, certificates for good work. All of these are endeavouring to control how you behave on a, and are, because they're outside of you, are external forms of social control. And of course, they do this through positive and negative sanctions. So the teacher giving you a damn good rollicking would be a negative sanction, whereas getting your certificate for being a good boy or girl and getting all your work done and revising hard for your criminology A-level would be a positive sanction. Let's hope we have to have more of those than the negative ones. So when we go with these external forms of social control, obviously everything that we've done in the criminal justice system, all those agencies within the criminal justice system are all external forms of social control. The police, the Crown Prosecution Service, the courts, the judiciary, the prison service, the probation service are all forms of external social control. And of course, they're using general, general, generally negative sanctions. You know, uh, there you've got the picture of the ankle tag, the solitary confinement in a cell. OK, but don't forget, there are a few positive uh, enforcement sanctions within the CJS. Um, for instance, you know, getting parole for good behaviour in the prison system or a lower sentence for assisting the prosecution in a court case. But generally, I think it'd be true to say in the CJS, the criminal justice system, it's negative sanctions, you know, negative reinforcement. But if you do this, this is what's going to happen to you. Right. Let's have a look at some more external forms of social control. Um, you need to be familiar with the phrase coercion. And that is the use of threat or force in order to make someone do or stop doing something. So this can involve physical or psychological force or other forms of pressure. So um, I've got the picture there of the cane. When I was at school, you could still be caned. So um, maybe that stopped me from behaving badly or did it? Um, you've got CCTV. I'll touch a bit more of that um, 
a bit more of that um, later on in this slideshow. But you know, it's nice. This cartoon vaguely amused me. This idea in the 16th century, how how did they make you behave? The idea that God was watching you because more people had a religious belief. Now, the police are watching you through CCTV cameras. And of course, the negative sanction of the CJS are the criminal justice system examples of coercion. Uh, that, so they're getting you to behave. So all those negative sanctions are coercion. Fear of punishment is a form of coercion, but the fear of being punished makes us conform and of course acts as a deterrent. Hopefully that makes sense. Carrying on with that, um, moving on further, I touched on CCTV. Let's think about that in a bit more detail because we have to look at that in little more detail later on the course so I make no bones about adding this slide in here so it's a method of social control because cameras occupy an area and they're recording events so that authority figures don't have to be there you know you don't have to have a bobby on the beat patrolling around because they can sit in the comfort of a big office and, um, and watch the cameras and see what's going on and it makes the police it's easier for the police to control criminals and of course, it's more reliable than witnesses to some extent because you've got everything there on camera. And if the camera's there, people are less likely to misbehave in theory. Okay. It also allows the police to monitor or determine whether someone's a danger. Uh, for instance, you know they can see what, how many police might be required to be called call to an incident because it's all there on CCTV. And it also. Um, allows them to prepare for a situation so if they can see someone armed with a knife walking through the street they know what group of police to send in or how many to send in and what might be needed as opposed to sending people in not knowing what they're going to encounter so all of this leads to controlling society stopping deviant or illegal behavior so CTV is a really good one to use and of course, as I said before, it does act as a deterrent to the general public. Now, in this idea of CCTV or someone's watching you, um, we'll do this a little later when I look at prison design, but I thought I'd just shove this in. Um, this is a panopticon and this was this came into prison design. And this is the idea. And you can see here that you've got sort of basically a circular room with cells with with doors all facing outwards. And this was the idea the guards would sit in this tower in the middle and they could see at all times, this is prior, before CCTV, every, every, um, inside every cell, they could see what every prisoner was doing. So they're trying to control the prison population because the prison population thought someone is watching me at all time. And that's a panopticon. We'll do that in more detail when we look at prison design. So. Let's have a look at some of the key criminologists on social control theory. You could mention Rees. Uh, Rees studied court records of over a thousand white youths on probation. So these people were out on probation, a thousand white youths. Um, and he, he basically came to a few conclusions. He said juveniles that have a weak ego or super ego, so they've got less self-control, are much more likely to have their probation remote. So basically, they're out on probation from prison. If they've got a weak superego, a weak, they've got um, a weak ego or superego, what's going to happen is they're going to end up committing crime. They're going to end up going back into prison. And that ties in with that idea of the conscience not functioning properly. He also said that poor school attendance clearly was associated with the low levels of success on probation. So you don't have those external forms of social control banging into you what to behave, etc., as teachers do. OK, so he said, you know, the school group, if school groups fail to provide the child with appropriate role models and fail to exercise social control, that's when problems started. And that's also why the government is trying desperately to reduce exclusion figures within schools, because it knows that as soon as you take that stability away, the school system where you're being taught right from wrong, you're taught rules, you're being taught to conform, as soon as people move outside that, they're more likely to not have those controls and they're more likely to move towards delinquent or criminal behavior. So Reese went along with that. The other big person you can look at is Walter Reckless. He's in most of the textbooks. 
He um, is responsible for containment theory, and he basically said that uh, our behaviour isn't caused by external factors. Uh, actually, our behaviour is um, determined by what we as individuals want and desire. So we want stuff, we desire stuff, um, and depending on how we see ourselves, what our self-image is, whether we see um, whether we see ourselves as being a good person or a bad person will determine whether we give in to things like peer pressure uh, and engage in delinquency to get what we want or desire or whether we don't. So if you have a positive sense of self, you, you contain those urges to do bad and so therefore you are controlled. Or if you externally have supervision and discipline Again, you have outer containment, which contains those urges again. So your inner containment is generated through and or developed your self-image, how you feel about yourself through your family and reckless thought that was basically formed by the age of 12. And outer containment was a reflection of good relationships with teachers and other forms of social socialization within the neighborhood like how you deal with the police your fellow um, your fellow citizens etc etc um, so he basically says what you've got is you've got pushes and pulls that might steer you towards delinquent behavior and if you could contain those pushes and pulls that's going to motivate you not to fall into um, fall into delinquent behaviour. So pushes are things like discontent with your living conditions and family conflicts, aggressiveness, hostility, so maybe due to biological factors. So those are things that push you into um, delinquent behaviour. You know, I'm living in a slum. Um, um, I'm living on my own because my wife's kicked me out. I've got nothing else to live for. Got no, my, there's no hope. I haven't got a job. That's a push towards me indulging in crime. Uh, I'm frustrated. I'm bored. Um, I'm a member of a minority group that's persecuted by the police. There are a lack of opportunities for me in, in a society which is institutionally racist. I can't get on in school. I'm jobless. All of these things might push you towards what getting what you want illegally. And your pulls are delinquent peers, etc. All my mates are encouraging me to go down and rob, a, um, rob somewhere. You know, that's your pulls. The delinquent subcultures, disaffected youth, gangs. And that's reckless. Oh, what I should add is the wherever there's a, uh, a blue arrow, such as up here, that in the PowerPoint that doesn't cover my, um, co uh, doesn't have me sitting in the corner talking to you through a video, that's a link through uh, to a website or a video about these people. So if you want to look at them in more depth, go to the other PowerPoint without me on it and have a, have a look at those links. So Hershey, he came up with social bond theory. He said that criminal activity occurs when we aren't attached to society. That bond that we have with society, hence social bond theory, uh, becomes weak, it snaps. Um, and it very much depends on how strong those social bonds are. So you need to imagine that all, he, all he's saying is, you know, we buy into society, we're bonded with society. If our bond is strong, then we're going to conform to societal rules and views. If, however, it's weak, we are much more likely to break and therefore break against society and break the rules of society. And he said, basically, you've got four bonds that tend to bind us together. Attachment, commitment, involvement and belief. OK, so if you're attached to society, you're committed, you're involved, you believe in it, you're much more likely to have that strong bond and not go to delinquent behaviour. And he said he could predict your typical delinquent. They were going to be young, single, unemployed, probably male. Whereas if you're married in work, you're far less likely to commit crime. Okay. 
if you're part of a social institution, you're less likely to go astray. You might like to think why your parents might have encouraged you to join groups such as uh, the Brownies or the Cubs or the Scouts or Beavers or whatever, because you are becoming part of a group, part of society, you're buying in, you're belonging. If you go and join a club, uh, be it a football club, a rugby team, you are attaching yourself, you're committing yourself, you're involved, and that bond starts to develop, which means you're much less likely to fall away from the societal norms that, we, that society wants you to follow. So let's recap as I get to the final slide on control theory. Hopefully you've understand what we mean by it. So control theory is stating that people have controls that stop them being deviant. Basically, these form two different types. You've either got internal social controls or external social controls. Internal controls are things like religious values, your conscience, morality, societal values and integrity. Your external social control is your law, friends, family, school, police, religious leaders, whatever. And the internal and external controls form your individual self-control. And that prevents you acting against societal norms. And the key to developing that social control is proper socialization, especially in early childhood. Just think of the ways that your parents, as, as people are bringing up children, are trying to reinforce those societal norms, you know, share, say please, say thank you, etc., etc. Okay. And of course, children who lack this social control may grow up to bit crimes and other deviant behaviours because if you haven't got that buy-in you're not going to want to be part of it and if you're not going to want to be part of it you're not going to want to obey the laws of it and so deviance occurs. <laughs>